The <clears throat> what transpired after the surrender of Japan then, uh, and how the United States treated nuclear weapons was a period of uncertainty. <laughs> Uh, I, we had discussed some of this in earlier sessions, but to repeat a few things, uh, President Truman's advisors, for the most part, were convinced that you wouldn't keep the secret of nuclear weapons. They'd proliferate. They didn't know how quickly it would happen, but you wouldn't keep the secret. Uh, the Cold War set in with the Soviets being extremely hostile to the United States and the West. The wartime alliance broke down. Uh, the attempt was made in the United Nations, I think a genuine attempt, I don't think it was just public relations, to present a plan that Dean Acheson and David Lilienthal mm -hmm. had chaired a committee to develop that Bernard Baruch then presented, and it goes by his name, the Baruch Plan, uh, for the control of nuclear weapons, our first attempt at arms control. That failed. Strategic Air Command was created. Uh, you had a small component, the 509th, that had dropped the atomic bomb in World War II. But we didn't have many atomic bombs, and they were almost la large Volkswagen-sized laboratory devices in those days. So it took a period of time for the technology, the development of smaller designs, uh, the geopolitics that set in, the realization that uh, you weren't going to have early arms control, and then, of course, the Soviets' nuclear test in 1949. For the United States to begin uh, developing a, a deterrence doctrine strategy that would last in many ways throughout the Cold War. Uh, why don't you tell us your ideas about how deterrence developed? And well, I think, I think it was a very complicated mental process mm -hmm. that developed over time. That mm -hmm. In many cases, President Eisenhower's decision to rely more on nuclear weapons really wasn't couched as a deterrent. Mm -hmm. It was a cast as a substitute for conventional military forces. Mm -hmm. That uh, it was fairly clear the motivation was, as he said, more buying for a buck. So the evolution from nuclear war fighting to deterrent was a matter of over time the balance changed. Mm -hmm. Because even after the Soviet Union uh, detonated their first nuclear weapon and then their first uh, fission weapon, which we call hydrogen bombs. Uh, even from that time, there was a very significant war fighting aspect to mm -hmm. the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, we deployed nuclear munitions on the battlefield that we redesigned and restructured land forces for conventional conflict on a nuclear battlefield, mm -hmm. that uh, we had the mixture in our fighter forces, a mixture, mixture of conventional weapons and nuclear weapons to, to be used on the essence, in, on essence on the same battlefield. So we had this mix of nuclear weapons will deter conflict but also that we will resort to nuclear weapons if that's what require, what's required to prevent major defeat mm -hmm. on the conventional battlefield. So that attitude persisted uh, well into the 60s. And in fact, when President Kennedy became, took office, uh, he began to put a great deal of stress on conventional conflict capabilities. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't until President Kennedy that we really began to move away from more bang for a buck. That we really began to move away from nuclear weapons as a major conflict war fighting tool. Interesting at the time, uh, there was a single wing, single fighter wing in the U.S. Air Force that did not have a nuclear mission. <laughs> that happened to be the wing that I was in. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yes. So, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, we went to Europe for the Berlin crisis, mm -hmm. and then we stayed in Europe, mm -hmm. and 
we had to write the tacky valve criteria. Mm -hmm. We had to write the processes, the command and control structure for how one controls a purely conventional mm -hmm. capability. <laughs> so I just give you that relationship mm -hmm. to show it really was a fairly long path to go from from we don't know what they're for mm -hmm. to these are war fighting assets to all oh, these are also have a deterrent value mm -hmm. to gradually moving towards principally deterrent value. So I would say we really didn't get to the point that uh, it was mostly the deterrent value of the market completely. Mm -hmm. Probably until the 80s. By the way, the strategic air command model was peace is our profession. And that was not just a slogan. Mm -hmm. That was, in fact, what came to be the mindset in strategic air command. And that is that while you must be always ready to employ nuclear weapons, the reason you have to be ready to employ nuclear weapons is that's a requirement for an effective deterrent. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe it was a fact that in Strategic Air Command we had the GSTPS and we targeted those weapons and we studied their effects mm -hmm. and we had a very clear view of the consequences of nuclear war that peace is our profession mm -hmm. became not just a slogan. It became a very deep commitment. But that evolution from 1945 to, I don't know, early 1980s mm -hmm. uh, was a matter of gradually changing the balance from primarily a substitute for conventional weapons mm -hmm. in a war fight situation to primarily a deterrent force that you really didn't ever want to have to use. 